Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second episode of This Week in Cloud Computing. I'm your host, Amanda Kulong, and with me in studio today, I have my co-host, Mark Jeffrey. Hello, Amanda. Good to see you, as always. Of course. And then of, we also have to my left here, Matt McNaughton, who is the co-founder of Culture Jam. Hello, Amanda. Hello, Mark. Yeah, we've got a full house because we also have on the line with us Brett Pyatt, who is the um, Director of Technical Alliances at Rackspace. How are you, Brett? Doing wonderful. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Good to have you. And then we also will have joining us on Skype, Scott Bills, who's the co-founder of Conformity. So you there you Appreciate are. How, how you? you doing, Scott? Doing great. How about yourself? <laughs> wonderful. Glad to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks. No, happy to be here. Great. So let's start off, you know, first off, for those of you who are watching online, obviously, it's thisweekincloudcomputing.com. Please also make sure you follow us on Twitter. It's TWICloudComp. Um, and our hashtag for the show is, is CloudComp as well. So if you want to include that, um, we'll be in the chat room and on Twitter. So let's get things going. We have two Austin-based companies, Rackspace and Conformity. And I would like to start off with you, Brett, um, one thing I'd like to do with the show is to get everyone's definition of cloud computing. It's so huge, and it's you know there's so many things that it encompasses. So how does Rackspace define cloud computing? So our view is that cloud computing it encompasses anything that you're not having to buy, set up, and manage yourself. So um, there's this idea that corporations should focus on IT services that are specific to their business and then find a partner out there in the cloud and pay for all the rest of the stuff uh, on demand um, in a utility model for what they need and allow them to better allocate their money towards things that differentiate them and, and help them build their business. Now, one term you just used, um, there are obviously a lot of buzz terms associated with cloud computing as well. What is utility computing? So utility computing is pay by the hour or by the day or by the month uh, where you say I need a thousand compute resources and you sign them up and the provider charges you uh, just like you get charged for your electric bill or your water bill at your house. You would do the same thing to get uh, a computing bill. Understand. So um, who, who really benefits the most, would you say, from your services? So it, it's really... Um, Small to medium business has the biggest benefit because they don't necessarily have the um, long-term horizon and capital base uh, that larger companies would have to build out and deploy things themselves. Mm -hmm. So where starting up a, an internet business 10 years ago might have cost you a million dollars to get going, right. now you can have the whole thing up and running for under $100,000. Wow, under 100000 I mean, that's, that's something we obviously see in the tech world in general. The startup costs are a lot lower, but you would say cloud computing definitely enables that. Yeah, it, okay. it, it, and it allows you to uh, only have to buy compute as you have subscribers and customers and sign-ups, and you can grow right with them so that your your compute costs are really tied to the service you provide your your users. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it sounds like it's wonderful in terms of scalability and being able to, you know, pull in what you need at, at any given time and then scale back down again so you're not wasting money. Absolutely. Okay. Well, Rackspace is pretty interesting, actually, because yeah. they started life as a data as a data center, a, a space to put you know yeah. racks and you know yeah. put your computers. So a traditional data center, um, and you've made the you've you've made the leap part way to well you've, you've made the way pool way to offering cloud offerings. Mm -hmm. um, but you're basically you're, you guys were brave enough to to cannibalize your own business uh, in a certain respect. You basically were jumping. This was a foreign thing initially for you guys. Um, how long? First of all, how long have you been doing it? I think it's about two years, if I remember correctly. Um, so, go ahead. Our, our first foray into cloud was in 2006 with what everyone's referring to now as a platform as a service offering, uh, where you can host a .NET or your typical LAMP stack applications, um, and then our sort of cloud compute services. Um, that everyone's infrastructure as a service where you get your on-demand servers by the hour and your sort of object file storage out there for images and everything else you need in your web apps um, is about to 12 to 18 months now that we've been hmm. online with those. I mean, that um, time frame just shows how, how new a lot yeah. of this is and why, yeah. why there's so much confusion, I think, in the market around cloud computing. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's growing pretty rapidly. I mean, we're um, a 12-year-old company 
Um, and the cloud is, is very new to us, and it's already up to 11% of our overall revenue at the end of the last quarter. Oh, wow. Wow. That's pretty significant. Excellent, congrats. Yeah, Brett, we actually, you know, we kind of moved up the uh, the ranks of, of, of Rackspace. We started with Slicehost, which is one of your own companies, and then when our needs mm -hmm. got bigger, we moved into your, your now cloud offerings, the, the, the MOSA uh, servers that you guys are running now. And uh, so it's really interesting to see us kind of moving through and uh, using the different services that you guys you guys offered, and now now really using a lot of the cloud computing. So, services. how do you, do you guys pay by the hour, or like what? What does your bill yeah. look like? Like, and, and by that I mean not amount, but you know, it's yeah, it's like, like he said, it's a utility bill. It's it's really we pay for what we use, and and because we're a startup, that changes on a day to day but basis. Specifically, is it like by the computing hour? Do you know? You yeah, know? it's it's um, what is it, Brett? It's not it's not hour. It's it's really data. Uh, storage and and um, the storage and transfer. Yeah, I would transfer. Think, yeah. yeah. Okay. Is that yeah, correct? And then on, on the the platform service, we have our own sort of compute cycles that compromise uh, are are comprised of what the web transaction is. So right, right. Uh, we, we're monitoring if you have a, a a really well written web application. Every visitor might cost you one compute cycle. If you have a a web application that is really compute intensive, then maybe everyone costs you 10. So this incentivizes That's, people now that hmm. to really um, look at how their application performs and, and optimize that because they can see the direct savings right away. Wow. That's interesting because that's not true if you have your own data center. Exactly. If you, write, right. if you write crummy or inefficient code, but it's perfectly serviceable to your end users, but actually it's crummy code. Right. You're not going to get penalized, and you're not going to. It's not going to uh, cost you money. Here, it actually costs you money. Yeah. Um, or you save money. That's another way. Look at it, but that's interesting. Well, it's great for startups. It means we're writing better apps, so we're forced to. <laughs> it's the bottom line, though. Right. That's good. Absolutely. Well, let's let's pull Scott into this discussion a little bit here too. So, Scott, with Conformity, you guys are are doing systems management for enterprises. Yeah, um, actually, can you tell tell me a little bit about what yeah. Conformity does and, and sort of run us through what you guys are up to? And your definition of cloud computing. Yeah, so so let me start with our, our definition. And Conformity spends the majority of um, you know our time in SaaS and, and the cloud application uh, world. So so cloud. Um, so the SaaS cloud software as a service, basically. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So Salesforce, Google Apps, um, applications like that. And you know the way we think about um, you know the definition of cloud is is from an application context. You know the the on demand. Uh, use of a, a shared application across a, a multi-tenant um, architecture. So using a you know same code base across multiple um, uh, customers, um, but on on-demand basis. And when I think about uh, more generally uh, cloud computing, I, I think about it the same way for for servers or storage as well. So the ability to provision and use on-demand um, virtualized uh, resources um, at any any level of uh, of the stack. And I think one of the interesting things that um, um, people mention but um, don't really focus on is that you know it's a significant technology trend but it's also a big business um, model and budgeting um, shift for IT as well Absolutely. So, if you think, so, so how IT has spent money in the past has been budgets driven primarily by by capex or capital expenditures um, upfront spend on uh, licenses or servers or um, storage and really, you're you're transforming that to much more of a operational expense or subscription basis, which um, a lot of the IT organizations you know we talk to, um, that's as big of a, a struggle from a management perspective as some of the technology is. Um, so it's it's very very interesting. Yes. Um, it's, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say, Scott, that's something that I'm curious about too. I mean, when it comes to who's in charge and who makes that final decision on the spend, is it is it tricky because it's a different model too? I mean, do you run into that? Yeah, absolutely, and and we see you know shifts occurring in in how that's happening um, as well. If you look at the SaaS industry and and how that really got hold and and grew um, um, in the market, it was really you know vendors selling to business users around IT effectively. Um, okay. The, the, the value proposition is the benefit is that you as a business user could swipe the credit card and go, and you didn't need to mm -hmm. get IT involved. And what we're finding now is that um, it's like any business technology where. Um, business users start, you know, the additional adoption wave, and there reaches a point where IT needs to get involved to help manage the the chaos that's being created. So that's part of the pendulum we see going on in, in SaaS right uh, right now. Um, and, and you know, in terms of what we do at Conformity, it's it's really focused on that. It's helping IT get their arms around the SaaS applications and users 
uh, that are proliferating across our organizations. So, you know, as you see 8, 10, 12 or more SaaS applications being deployed, IT needs a way to centrally manage users and access across all of those different um, applications. And they're, they, they need to be managed in a fundamentally different way from, um, you know, your traditional on-premise applications. So we really help IT um, centralize that, streamline it, make it easier, and make it more attractive, frankly, for them to adopt on-demand and, and SaaS applications. Okay. So, Scott, on a practical level then, how, how would you um, suggest that um, larger enterprises especially start to approach the purchase of, of cloud-based management solutions? Yeah, I think they have to realize that, you know, from an overall compliance governance management point of view, it's one of these things where, you know, the cloud changes everything, the cloud changes nothing in some respects. So from a compliance standpoint, organizational responsibilities are, are exactly the same. So when IT look at, looks at how it's going to, to manage and enforce policy across SaaS applications, it has the same responsibility as it does with, with on-premise. So I think they need to understand that eyes wide open going in, taking a look at SaaS applications, that they need to think about how they're going to manage these um, in their infrastructure um, in a way that allows them to align it with their, their policies, but at the same time continues to give the business users the flexibility um, that they want and, and needs and, and makes the SaaS model so attractive to them. Okay. And Brett, quickly, uh, on your side too with Rackspace, how would you recommend or how do you approach it when someone first comes to you to say, we think we need the cloud, what do you say back to them? So we really try to look at what business problems they're trying to solve because I'm... Which is they, really what it should always go back to, right? <laughs> yeah, the cloud is big and broad, like, as you said. And so, I mean, people want things like email that integrates with their Blackberries and their iPhones. And so we, we want to find out what their problems are and then do we have the right solution for it either directly or through our, our partners um, that we set up and work with so that we can deliver whole solutions to customers. Because at the end of the day, right. um, they're coming to a service provider or solution provider like us to solve the entire problem for them, not tell them, well, we can solve this half and you'll need to go find somebody else to solve this other half on your own. Absolutely. Well, I want to take a minute um, to thank our sponsor quickly here. Um, we have Verticor, verticor.com. Yep. Um, great sponsor for us. Bring it up on screen here. So, you know, is your cloud hosting provider letting you down? Um, take a look at managed private cloud solutions from Verticor. They're more secure, more reliable, more redundant than other providers. A managed private cloud solution can easily replace your current IT infrastructure and eliminate IT pains. For instance, completely avoid the cost and hassle of buying and maintaining IT equipment and software, deliver 100% uptime to end users, configure and deploy computing resources in just minutes. Um, with Verticore, your private cloud is hosted in the most advanced and secure data center on the planet, uses only best-in-class hardware and software, and gives you access to virtually unlimited bandwidth. Um, Verticore's team of experts monitor and maintain your private cloud 24-7, 365, freeing your internal staff to concentrate on supporting only your applications and projects that can help grow your company. Verticore, and um, actually you can also follow them on Twitter, at Verticore. Yep, and Verticore.com. Verticore.com. Um, we're going to be using them actually for uh, some okay. stuff we're doing with it this weekend, ne network fairly soon. Excellent. So, yeah, they've been really responsive, really great. So okay. Really happy. So a lot of the same messaging here with, with Verticore. Um, I would like to step in um, briefly here, since we've got Matt in studio, and talk a little little bit about this notion of, well, music, music in the cloud. We do have two Austin-based cloud companies here on the on the show with us, so of course I'm alluding to South by Southwest. Yeah. Um, because a huge topic of discussion leading up to South by, which is coming around the corner in about two weeks or so is this whole notion toward the move um, to cloud-based music. So, you know, we have Apple making the iPod a success by changing people's perception of music from a product to a service, you know, a single song to download that you want, you know, as needed, um, as opposed to a CD. And then now it's shifting again. We're downloading so much music that we're running out of storage, too. Um, and the cloud is promising to be this place where we can safely keep our music and hopefully at some point be able to easily access it from anywhere on any device. Um, you know, Matt, I just wanted to throw this out there at you. Do you do you think, you know, based on your Culture Jam's major relationships with all of these different record labels, um, do you see a shift um, in discussions with them about moving more to the cloud? You know, I, I think it's it's this big horizon of, of music on the cloud, and, and really a lot of people are, are sitting and waiting to see who the major players, what moves they right. do, and, and, and 
everyone's really watching Apple to see what the acquisition of Lala means. Mm -hmm. I think what it does mean is 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 having your iTunes library in the cloud. What is Lala actually? For yes, let's don't make sure know. everyone knows yeah, what Lala is. Lala is this fantastic service, and they they still are a fantastic service. Um, mm -hmm. They are a streaming music uh, destination site. They had this really unique model where you could stream songs uh, once for free, and then I believe it was 10 cents a stream after that. Or you could pay 10 cents and you could stream it uh, in perpetuity. Or you could purchase the song for <coughs> as low as 89 cents to, to 99 cents. So it was kind of iTunes with a streaming component. And, okay. and it was very interesting. And I, I, they did a, a fantastic job of building this, uh, this cloud-based structure for streaming music and streaming it quickly and on demand. And so I think that's why iTunes acquired them is, is they built the infrastructure for that on-demand right. uh, iTunes environment. And it'll be really interesting to see where, where Steve and his and Jobs and his team take it because you know, they've already got this fantastic store and with this cloud-based uh, you know, streaming destination site, we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes. And I, I really think it's going gonna, it's gonna to sort of put your whole music collection on the cloud and hopefully hopefully it'll be sort of omnipresent Isn't Rhapsody one day. sort of doing something like that where you basically mm. do a subscription service and then you stream I remember I was using it for a while I but so. I yeah. use, I've used it for yeah. like a year or two. There's so. Rhapsody and then obviously we have Google coming back with a response there there is talk that they're looking to acquire Catch Media which is similar um, you know obviously they they were looking to Lala as well but yep. Apple obviously trumped them on that. Um, but yeah, Google is now looking at Catch Media, which is also an LA-based cloud um, music service company. So you know we've got these two major players that are all looking to cloud music, and um, just curious to see where that's going to go. I mean, what what do you think, guys? You know, what, um, let's start with um, with Brett. Brett, do you have have you heard talk of of cloud music, and is any is anyone approaching you, or are you working with anyone in, in cloud music? So um, we're focused on providing the infrastructure, so for mm -hmm. a number of folks out there, um, we have uh, encoding partners that do both video and audio encoding, okay. um, and a, a number of uh, music and media related companies um, host their infrastructures with Rackspace. I can't really share specific right. names of, course. Uh, of folks, um, because, but uh, yeah, definitely a lot of interest from that, and that, there's a lot of growth. I think we're going to see um, music and video both explode on the internet over the next 10 years as mm. uh, bandwidth continues to get faster and cheaper um, right. and available in more areas. So in general terms, without naming mm. names, um, would you say that the volume of, of music providers doing things in the cloud has increased? I don't know if you can answer that question or not. but Yeah, the music providers are definitely going more online and we're, we're going to consume um, from services like La La and Rhapsody and Pandora and, and so I, I think that the and iHeartRadio and all of these streaming services uh, is the way everyone's going to consume music a decade from now. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And Scott, what do you think? I mean, here you are in Austin. What are you hearing? Is there word on the street from people you know, that, that it's going to be the year of music in the cloud? I mean, what, what's the take on conformity side? Yeah, I think generally I, I would agree that you know, you, I think there will be an explosion in the cloud with, with both music and, and video. Um, at conformity, we, we don't see a, a, we don't get exposure to a ton of the, 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 um, the trend and activity around that as, as we're focused a little bit more on and helping enterprises manage, uh, manage cloud uh, applications. But you know, in terms of what we see in here, um, here in Austin, uh, it's, it's very, very consistent that um, you know, with the, what I think the other guys have said here, that um, you know, there's 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 an explosion of of, of music and, and video on the on the web, and, and continue to um, you know expect that uh, to to grow further um, um, going forward. So, um, excellent. Well, I think it's about time for some our Glafflin. I can't Mark even. Mark Glafflin group. Mark Glafflin group. <laughs> Mark Glafflin. Tongue Man, twister. <laughs> From Santa Monica, Mark Laughlin Group, the American Original. Yes, as usual, I'm very <laughs> proud of my opening. This is very awesome. <laughs> All for you, Mark. Issue one. Oh no, here we go. <laughs> what is Apple building? Mm. According to data center knowledge, Apple is building a one billion dollar data center. It is 500,000 square feet, nearly five times the size of Apple's facility in Newark, New Jersey. There are many theories about what they're building. In fact, 
I believe our spy cameras have captured the facility. Can we put that up on the screen? There it is! Dun dun dun! What is that? <laughs> the spy satellite of Mahalo and this show have captured this. Anyway. So, question. <laughs> what is it? Is it for video? Cloud-based music? Or something else? I ask you, Eleanor. I say it's, it looks like my grandparents' backyard, and, and it looks like they're growing a bunch of corn and stuff, if you look at it from that view. Satellite, but it? I'm from Maine, <laughs> so I have to go by you know what I've seen there. So I think it's corn. I think it's corn, okay. <laughs> and your view on the matter? Um, I, I'm, I'm probably not going to say corn, uh, but I think they're trying to take my iPod and my iTunes and all the movies that I've downloaded on iTunes and, and, and put it in their data center so I can grab it from wherever I am, wherever I'm going. That's kind of where I think. I think one day I'm, I'm going to jump in my car and turn on an iTunes application in, in my car stereo and be able to get all of my music right there and, and potentially watch a DVD for the kids so in the back. So you think it's a big, it's basically for media? It's a big media I think so. center? I think so. I think, I think they, wa I want, they want to house and distribute your media. Okay. Um, real quick, in the chat room, Scott Simcoe says Area 51. Yeah, well, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to our uh, remotes. Um, let's see, Scott, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I, I think, uh, I agree. I think it's a personal media library in the cloud that you can access uh, anywhere from, from any device, and it's, it's music, video, and, and, and photos, and anything that you want to store and have access to. So uh, I believe it's a, it's, a, it's a media library that, uh, that um, you know, Apple will provide to uh, to users. All right. Finally, Brett. I'm going to uh, avoid guessing at what they're up to next because they're usually very good at surprising us. So. That's a good point. <laughs> they are yeah. indeed. Well, there's another theory which says that they're actually getting into the cloud business and they may come mm -hmm. and compete with you guys and you know and basically become a provider as well. So. I, I think more than anything, what it says if you go back to that image is. Um, on the first show, we talked about this notion of the cloud and everything's in these pink, fluffy clouds. It's not true. There's still a physical place where yeah. all of this stuff has to go, case in point. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's always a data center. And compound. even though the rest of us can, you know, access things through the cloud, it still has to sit somewhere. So I think more than anything, that's the key point here. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Issue number two. <laughs> in February of 2009, Salesforce.com chairman and CEO Mark Benioff boasted that Salesforce.com was the very first billion dollar cloud computing company. The company announced in 2009 the year end revenue of 1.07 billion, which was a 44% increase from 2008. Question, is Salesforce the very first billion dollar cloud computing company? I ask you, Matt. Mm. Um, Matt Cannon. What about Amazon? Hasn't, hasn't Amazon well, I think had point, it? Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it, see, this is the debatable point. This yeah. is about the, the, flu, the slushiness of the word cloud. Right. Exactly. And, and the cloud washing that we heard from uh, the loud washing. Our guests from I mean, last if you've week. got multiple data centers, can anyone call themselves a cloud? I, there this you is go. a good question. I mean, so a lot of people would say that it depends on whether you think Salesforce.com is a cloud computing company or not. Right. <laughs> so, I don't know. What do you, what's, what's your view on it, Brett? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on what that definition of cloud is again. I mean, mm -hmm. is, is Yahoo the first cloud computing billion-dollar company um, back when they really start and, and monetize search and advertising on the Internet? Um, was Google because they do host applications and have documents? And it, it really all depends, I think, on, on how you define cloud. All right. Finally, uh, I guess Scott. Yeah, yeah, it clearly depends on the definition, but I'll I'll give it to them. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the way I think about it, it's 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 shared, um, you know, uh, IT or compute resources, and and they're just doing it at the application um, um, layer. And uh, yeah, I think there's certainly more to come, but I will uh, I'll give them the prize for being the first. <laughs> I I would say they're the first billion dollar SaaS company. Absolutely. Yeah. If I were going to get yeah, I think specific, that's fair. absolutely. So Mark Benioff was also, you know really great about getting his face and the, and the name out there and building that brand and really helping to explode SaaS yeah. um, on a larger scale. Yeah, Salesforce is the one everyone points to. It's the first exactly. thing out of everyone's mm -hmm. mouth when they talk about SaaS. So. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're taking care of that one. Issue number three, transportability in the cloud. Last June, Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz started a new company hoping to speed enterprise adoption of cloud computing. 
The company officially launched as Macara. And they offer technology to quickly deploy apps and migrate them between cloud platforms. Um, so in English, <laughs> what this means, and I'm like, I'm gonna, they basically encapsulate an application. I'm not going to do the voice because I have to explain this. So basically what, <laughs> I, I can't do both. So what Macara does is they basically put, what they call it a software capsule around the application. And the idea behind that is that you can move it from one cloud offering to another very right. easily. So you don't have to worry about the, you know, the quirks of one cloud uh, offering um, being different from, you know, another one. There's, there's always, I mean, basically, like you say, there's always a data center, which means there's always physical hardware, um, different operating systems, different installations of various things. So you're, at some point, you're not really living in a virtual universe. You're right. on a machine somewhere. Yeah. So and anytime you move something from one, an application from one machine to another, there's going to be differences. There's going to be little quirky things, yeah. different processors, mm -hmm. different kernels, you know, different versions of things that don't quite all mesh. So, um, so basically, the, the idea behind this is making it so that you don't have to worry about that and reduces the risk of, of betting on one, um, you know, one cloud offering. So, so is this an application framework at which you build your application from start to finish within within Macara environment? You, you don't actually build the application in the Macara environment. You build it on top of it. Okay. So it's basically a layer of virtualization mm. on top of their layer of virtualization. Okay. <laughs> so, so I mean, you know, the <laughs> argument. So, so the well, question is, first of all, is how? What I was going to ask is, how necessary is this? Yeah. Is this really a pain? Like you guys actually would be the first ones I would ask because you're an application provider. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we're we've got an application that brings in a lot of consumer data from from these. We do these incent incentivized Twitter promotions for mainly music labels and, and entertainment companies, and we take in a lot of analytics of folks coming to the applications. Now, every single people that every person we talk to talk about you know, the, store, the, the data security of, of, of all that analytic data that's coming through. And, you know, I could potentially say, hey, look, if you've got your own cloud computing uh, provider, if you want it hosted on your own cloud, we can do that, and I can just easily port it from place to place. I honestly don't know how many, how many enterprises are at that point where they're confidently running their own cloud computing uh, you know, services and, and, and confident with moving things around the cloud yet. But maybe, okay. I mean, we, we, we sure aren't far from it. Okay, Brett, what do you think? Uh, I think that it's going to be necessary for the next few years uh, as different cloud standards emerge and mm -hmm. uh, ways that the applications run uh, sort of get standardized across the infrastructures. Um, and I think everything that we can do to help ease adoption um, and ease transition from uh, legacy data center design to cloud data center design uh, will will actually will help everybody out. So really looking forward to uh, tools like that being successful and uh, helping solve the bridge the gap, I guess, to get you off right. of where you were onto a cloud. Brett, do you find that there's there is this an objection that people have to the cloud? I mean, you find people. Um, are wary of the fact that they may not be able to move? Is, is this like a real objection, I guess, to, to a sale? Uh, yes, it is, because I mean, you're really, a, um, as an application provider, um, looking to be able to provide your service out to your end users, and if one partner that you're relying on for your infrastructure turns out not to be the partner you wanted, um, if you have to spend a year redesigning your application, um, I mean, it, it may mean the end of your company. So uh, being able to have something that's open and standards-based and, and a way mm -hmm. that you can move from one provider to another, um, you may need new geographic coverage. Um, I mean, like Rackspace's cloud today is only in North America. We have dedicated data centers globally, but you may need to use uh, Amazon's cloud in Europe and Rackspace's cloud in the U.S. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, really quick, Brett, how far away do you think we are from standardization with the cloud? I think, I mean, this is really early, as you said, that yeah. um, we've, we've had our cloud online for a little more than a year now. Um, and with this, it's going to take a number uh, of years from here on forward. Um, we're looking at some stats out there. Uh, there's a Jack of All Clouds blog, <laughs> and they, they look at Let's the, look that out. Yeah. Of the <laughs> top 500,000 uh, websites on the Internet that are hosted on cloud platforms. And at this point, we're only at 1% of those cloud a or applications are on a cloud. Wow, so, that's pretty telling. Wow. Yeah. Only 1%? It, 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 that's yeah, about really around 5,000 out of the 500,000 wow. have, have moved over. 
and they're roughly evenly split between Rackspace and Amazon, and then for 85% of that, and then the other clouds are very small at this point adoption-wise. So uh, this is where I, I think until we have a large number of clouds out there that are getting adoption, yep. um, and, and we get to a point where we can really sit down and figure out how to make everybody interoperate and work together. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And Scott, how, what do you weigh in on this? Do you really think transportability is a major pain point? Yeah, I think it's something that's that's clearly you know visionary, and I think one of the interesting thing, things to think about, and and we get to ask this a lot from a SaaS perspective, is is where you know where does industry consolidation go? So you know, are you going to end up in a world where you have maybe two or three master brands for cloud platforms, or are you going to have a much more kind of heterogeneous landscape? And you know, that's that's something we do a lot of thinking here about um, you know conformity, just from a SaaS you know perspective. Um, because one of the things we believe is is one of the the value drivers of of cloud, uh, particularly on the application side, is the um, the opportunity for organizations to really kind of leverage best of breed, um, given the fact that it's much more easy and um, um, uh, easy to deploy SaaS applications, and and they're much more flexible. So so we believe it's a world where there will be heterogeneity, in which case uh, transportability and portability is going to be very important. Um, and I think the other dimension is is you know as we've talked about is the, is the standards piece, and and when does that come together? I, I think it does happen over time. Standardization is both for SaaS and cloud, but. Um, but we're not there yet, and I think the thing with standards is that you know effective standards only um, you know emerge after um, business problems have been solved, um, mm -hmm. not before. And mm -hmm. frankly, it's so early that a lot of business problems haven't been been effectively addressed yet, and uh, yet to come. So um, I think it's ahead of its time. Uh, very very promising and, and a very interesting bet on the future of of where clouds going. Okay, excellent. We actually have. Um a comment from the chat room from Ewan Spence um, saying that surely standard is, with standardization, um, the whole cloud becomes commodity and you lose vendor lock-in. So that's nice in an ivory tower way, but will commercial reality stop standardization? Who wants to jump in on that one? Um, okay, so go ahead. I'm, yeah, I'm happy to jump in here. I mean, we really um, don't think that lock-in is a good idea for the cloud providers. We're mm -hmm. trying to be as open and standards-based as possible because we want to drive uh, adoption and help this cloud transition. Uh, I mean, we can all try to have lock-in and fight over a proprietary, very small pie. Right. Uh, right. And if we look at some just more broad industry numbers, there's 50 million servers running globally right now, wow. somewhere in that ballpark. And even if you, if you call cloud the infrastructure stuff that we're talking about and SaaS and all of these uh, hosted internet services, um, you're looking at less than 10% of those servers are out there in, in a cloud platform or cloud deployment. Mm -hmm. So those other 90% of the servers, we want to get them to move over to cloud. Absolutely. And in order to do that, I think you need to have an open standards-based approach so people aren't afraid. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what you're saying then is by, by being open and, and following, you know, just being standardized, then you're helping drive adoption in essence. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Excellent. Um, anything else we want to do? We want to go on to an, our next issue. I suppose we should. I believe we should too. Issue number four. <laughs> our data center providers, the real winners in cloud computing. Data center builders have been called the arms dealers to the cloud. At the end of the day, the cloud is nothing more than a data center somewhere on the ground. Or sea land, if you know where that is. You know, you know what sea land is? It's a platform off of Great Britain, they declare themselves an independent nation. And the thing that's interesting about that, center. yes, is that it's a big data center. So <laughs> they serve, yeah, and they're connected to the internet. And they're basically like, we don't have to, all the gambling laws and all that, they don't apply to us. And oh my. Blah, blah, blah. So yeah, so it's basically a data, I don't know, safe haven, if you will. Not a vacation hotspot. Though. No, not really. That's no. not an old oil platform. <laughs> no, off okay. the coast of Britain, so anyway. Equinix is reporting hefty increases in demand for their services. In every gold rush, the person who sells the shovels is the one certain to make a profit. Question, our data center providers, the real winners in this cloud meme? I ask you. Sorry. <laughs> Matt. Matt, what do you think? <laughs> you know, I, I really don't know. I, I don't know the cost structure of, of building data centers or, or the vendors there. Um, I can imagine it's, it's going to be a pretty good business for them in the next 10 to, to 15 years. Uh, or over the over the next ten to fifteen years, 
I mean, just look at the the size of of that that data center that your your spy drone from yes, the, spy, camera. spy camera took. Mm -hmm. um, you know that that that's a pretty massive thing. That that looks like half the size of North Carolina. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> okay, let's go to you, Brett. What do you think? Who's really the the real winner in cloud computing here? Is is it the data center? So I, I, at the end of the day, the Business IT folks are the real winners out of cloud because it simplifies their life and, and lets folks make more money on their products and spend more money on their products and less on the infrastructure. The data center providers have been building data centers for as long as we've had computers. Um, they're just building large facilities now for a few people instead of small facilities for thousands of people. So. Um, you? As computing grows, the data center providers win. So I, I think they want to see us all streaming our music and, and doing more mm -hmm. things in the digital world, and that's how the data center builders win. Yeah. Uh, do you, I mean, do you, are you, I don't know if you can answer this or not, but I'm wondering whether other people, not Rackspace, are building cloud offerings on your infrastructure. So therefore you win, you know, whether they go with your cloud offering or someone else's that's built on your infrastructure. Can you tell me whether anyone's doing another cloud offering on your on your hardware? So yeah, we have a reseller program where people can build offerings on, on top of our services. Uh, and there are a number of uh, platform as a service uh, providers that run on Rackspace and, and many of the other infrastructure clouds out there as well. So um, I mean, there, there's absolutely, as you continue to move all the way up through to the software as a service um, sort of food chain there, as we provide services down deeper in the stack, other people are going to build on top of that yeah. and provide a service out to their users. Is is cloud computing better for you guys, or are you just forced to go along with it because it's the you know the hot meme right now? Is it? I'm just wondering. Like, do you, is it for someone like you? Is, do you would you prefer in your heart of hearts for in your looking at your business bottom line that people be in data centers or that they use the cloud? I think the growth of hosting overall, and if cloud helps grow hosting, that, that helps our business. Yeah. Um, I think that we try to service the customer needs through either dedicated hosting or cloud hosting, and both of, um, it just general growth of hosting is going to help, and cloud is helping grow the hosting sector right now. Okay. My guess is that he can't answer that. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, uh, and just to be completely yeah. fair, and you've been very gracious about answering a lot of questions that are, are difficult for someone in a public company to answer. Um, I th my guess is that right now it's not as profitable as they would like, um, but it will get there because they need to figure out all the virtualization and you know basically work the kinks out of it so that it is a lot more profitable. And as we've said, it's just so new. Yeah. You know that that's the big thing. It's really so new. And so Scott, what about you? Let's make sure we've pulled you into this too. Are data centers the actual winners here? Who, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a, as a general rule with, with trends like this, it's, it is the arms dealers that uh, that end up winning. <laughs> like that term, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but 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 I but I do agree. At the end of the day, it's really the the users and the customers um, that. Thank that you. I would agree with so, you. You know, they get they get more innovation. They get faster innovation at a, at a lower cost. Um, and whether that's you know someone accessing music in the cloud or an enterprise deploying applications or, or servers or storage in the cloud are the ones that uh, uh, that benefit and um, and you know um, particularly on the, the business side um, spend more of their time focusing on on adding value to the business. So I think it's the end users at the end of the day that that are really going to be the, the the winners. And Scott, to follow up on that, I mean from a startup point of view. Um, you know, it's something that I, I demand now. It's it's in high demand from my side. And I can only imagine that from every every other startup uh, founder and, and CEO who's trying to get get things going, but get things going at a cost effective uh, price point. And and it really becomes a, a matter of incubating these companies up to the point that maybe they, they they need to buy into a data center that they've got such a behemoth behemoth of a company and the user base that it makes sense for them to to build those own data centers. But yeah, it, and, it's a farm you know, league, maybe. Yeah, no, and, and here at Conformity, we we founded the company you know, basically about three years ago and built it, uh, you know, from the cloud um, initially. And when you think about uh, what we had to spend to get the business up and running, um, basically out of a world class data center, just you know, it's a mere fraction of what it would have cost three, five, ten years ago. Um, so the, 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 the impact of, of cloud um, on startups, I think, um, really can't be emphasized enough in terms of what you can do with uh, relatively kind of limited investment or, or bootstrapping your business. 
Okay. Um, one final point on that. In the chat room, we have Webb Collins saying that data centers will do well, but the biggest returns will be had by the new breakthrough applications and entrepreneurs that take advantage of what the cloud and data centers enable. So. Yeah, so it really yeah. lowers the barrier to entry for. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think that's been the big consensus so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where, where the sweet spot of the cloud is, is, is at the low to mid end at this point. Oh, yeah. Don't know where we would be without it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, final story over here, Mark. Issue number five. Now, this is kind of old, but I thought it was good anyway. <laughs> Oracle CEO Larry Ellison's rant Cloud is fa, fa, fa fashion. <laughs> All right, this is from 2008. But it's interesting nonetheless. I, I should have brought it to the first show because it's, it's <laughs> awesome. So Larry Ellison, the Oracle CEO, says has this to say. This is a quote. The interesting thing about cloud computing is that we've redefined cloud computing to include everything that we already do. I can't <laughs> think of anything that isn't cloud computing with all these announcements. The computer industry is the only industry that is more fashion-driven than women's fashion. Maybe I'm an idiot, but I have no idea what anyone is talking about. What is it? It's complete gibberish. It's, in, it's, it's insane. When, the, when is this idiocy going to stop? We'll make cloud computing announcements. I'm not going to fight this thing, but I don't understand what we would do differently in the light of the cloud. Question, is Ellison right? What do you think, Amanda? Mm, I think Ellison likes to hear himself talk sometimes. <laughs> well, there's, there's, that. there's that. Brett, what do you think? Uh, I, I think he's got a valid point to a, a certain extent is that uh, I mean, Oracle's been providing services to for applications over networks for as long as they've been around. I mean, they they didn't start as a mainframe company, so with the database doesn't do much by itself. So um, it it all depends again, yeah, where and how do you define cloud? And I think that's part of of Larry's rant there is, yeah, what exactly is it, and, and where do we draw the lines? I mean, Oracle's had their on-demand services here; they've got a huge cloud data center in Austin that they've had for a, a number of years uh, powering their, their Oracle on demand offering. Does that make them a cloud company? Mm. Yeah, well, it's definitions. I think people are cloud companies if they want to be cloud companies, it seems like these days. <laughs> what do you think, um, Scott? Yeah, I think it's, it's, there's some truth in what he's saying. I think there certainly is a lot of, of hype and, and smoke around uh, cloud and SaaS, but you know, at the same time, um, you know, he was also an early investor in NetSuite and Salesforce, so clearly Larry mm -hmm. you know, saw something in that model that uh, was interesting to him. So, you know, I, I think his overall point that, that things in, in the IT and computer industry tend to get overhyped is, is valid, but, you know, I think there is some, some substance there that, uh, that is different that, that needs to get recognized as well. Cool. Okay. Fair enough. I guess we'll go to the news next. Yeah, we're, we're getting down to the news. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little bit out of order. Okay, yeah. I don't know if we have no, I guess we don't have sound on. Hmm, we, we lost sound. Oh, well. All right, so basically, um, I'm gonna skip around a little bit, okay. so we're not gonna do it in the same order. Um, so this just hot off the press right before we came in here, I saw this. Um, three Terra acquired by CA. So IT software giant CA um, acquired cloud computing startup Three Terra. Um, no word on what the terms were. Um, but basically, um, so, I'm gonna, so the, the main product is a thing called AppLogic. So AppLogic, I'm going to read exactly what their press release said. Um, at AppLogic treats the entire N-tier application as a single logical entity that can be copied, instantiated, configured, started, stopped, cloned, exported, imported, etc. What that means in English. I was going to say, what language are you speaking right <laughs> so, now? All right, so basically, 3 Terra's got, a, got what, something they call a grid operating system. Okay. All right, so it rests, rests on top of uh, the AppLogic distributed kernel. So memory management is distributed, the logic connections, the schedulers, storage, all mm -hmm. that stuff. Um, now, here's here's the interesting, and this is another one of these companies that's very similar to the Andreessen company. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, there's there seem to be this seems to be an old trend going on here. Yeah. Where these uh, distributed operating or virtualization, they mm -hmm. call them distributed operating systems. Um, they become they're, they're becoming more popular. Or they're becoming necessary, it seems, mm -hmm. um, or, or helpful, and this may be part of increasing the profitability for people like like Rackspace and other providers. Yeah. Um, and here's the interesting thing, though. Is I remember I was at a company um, 10, 15 years ago, and they basically did a distributed operating system. And they had a, what they got really hung up on distributed garbage collection, basically reclaiming memory bits that weren't used okay. by the operating system across multiple machines. And the problem became basically intractable. It was basically so complex 
that they, they just like mud they just basically got caught in a mud pit on that <laughs> and it almost it basically almost killed the company so oh, wow um, anyway so the question I have is first of all are these things really necessary um, do you, are you and I guess to the the providers are you using uh, things like three Terra and the Andreessen I'm sorry I can't remember the name Macara. of the Macara, thank you mm -hmm. I guess we'll go to Brett first so We've built um, our infrastructure at, at a layer below where those would run. And I think this, this comes back to just kind of the enterprise and the adoption of the Java virtual machine and the Java app server is that enterprises want to write their applications in a manner that they can move them from one hardware infrastructure to another, one operating system infrastructure to another. So that way they, they don't end up if all of a sudden next week um, one uh, processor vendor announces a, a magic chip that's a million times faster than CPUs today and costs a dollar. If you had written your app in some way that you couldn't move to take advantage of that, now you're at, at a horrible disadvantage to everybody that can move over. So um, I, I think for users um, and consumers of, of our infrastructure services, doing something like this or writing your, your application on top of something that's portable is, is a huge advantage for you. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Scott? Yeah, I think certainly from a provider standpoint, there's advantages to that model and to the portability. You know, here at Conformity, it's not something that we've we've had to do or had to think about yet. I think that's something that down the road from a from a portal standpoint, we'll have we'll have to consider. But um, you know, it's almost like we were discussing before. It's 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 a it's a issue set, it's a problem set that's coming down the road. But um, you know, certainly something that we haven't had to to. Um, you know, address as, as we build out our, our business and technology stack. Um, on a larger scale, Mark, too, I, I'm more interested also in does this acquisition show that there are going to be more acquisitions of specific cloud computing companies? I would say the answer to that is yes. Yes. It yeah. seems to be a very hot space right now. Mm -hmm. People are making tools. It seems like the, the speed with which people right. are making tools for these sorts of things is Mm -hmm. And you yeah. people like Andreessen doing it. I mean, Andreessen's always been interested in the cloud. I mean, that, that, yeah. that loud cloud is, you know, the yeah. company. Oh, right loud cloud, I've heard that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, it was a while ago. He actually, he's one of the first people yeah. that, you know, I guess probably coined. Yeah, I'm sure he didn't coin the phrase, but like, I'm sure that Early a lot of there, people yeah. drew from that. That's name actually that a good trivia question. Who, t you know, coined the well, term Well, we talked a little bit about this computing. last time. It's a, a little bit. bit. Ambiguous, but yeah. very less. Yeah, if anyone knows, I mean, we'd love to know. I mean, exactly. the fact that it's only 10% of these 50 million servers globally are, are, are cloud-based, are, are cloud systems, that, that sounds like a good market to be uh, building businesses in right now. Exactly. Okay. Cool. Okay, so next one. Um, this comes from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Walt, Mar Walt, bleh, Walt Actually, Katie. Mossberg. I believe oh, Katie, Katie wrote this one. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if I misattributed. Um, anyway, so it's about a company called Pogo Plug. Um, sorry, the project is called Pogo Plug. This, the company is called Cloud Engines. Mm -hmm. And basically, what they make is a device, it's a storage device, and it sits in your house, not in a data center somewhere. And it's like this cute little, I, I saw a picture of it. It's the pink. Is pink. Yeah, really? <laughs> the pink little, yeah, it looks like it's very. It's actually pink. That's what I want in my house. <laughs> So. Amanda will like it. <laughs> Amanda will love it, but I don't, rest of us, I don't Not know. this Amanda, his My Amanda, sister his sister. My sister and co-founder. <laughs> oh, got it, okay. Um, but anyway, the idea is, from what I read, is that basically it sits on your desktop, and all of you, you, you store your movies, your music, um, Microsoft Word documents, PDFs, on this. Huh. And uh, so basically, you have your own little personal cloud in your house, and then you can access that from the web from other places. So it's sort of like a, an inverted cloud, which is mm -hmm. kind of strange. Mm. And yeah, so um, so the basically the, the the title of the article was "Get Your Storage Out of the Cloud." So <laughs> <laughs> by creating like a desktop cloud. So mm -hmm. question: Is this really stretching the term cloud to like an almost ridiculous level by applying it to what I, what sounds to me like to be like the inverse of what I think of as the cloud? Well, I, I think personally it almost addresses the whole public-private hybrid thing in, in a weird way. I mean, what do you think, Brett? I know that you guys have quite a bit to say about that at Rackspace. Yeah, so uh, we actually have a, a partner that makes a product similar to that called the Cloud Plug. And what this does is it, it, it's the next generation of file server for small to medium business or for the Pogo Plug ones really targeted towards consumers. And mm -hmm. Rackspace really tries to stay with stuff that's a little bit more business targeted. Right. Um, so it, instead of having a bunch of disks inside of the file server at your 
house or your office, you just have the plug there, and then all the data is really stored out in the cloud. And I think that's why they call mm -hmm. these cloud devices. It's just it gives you the, the file server front end and a web interface to, to browse and map um, and, and allows you to infinitely store all of your music. Like we were saying earlier, mm -hmm. we keep moving all this stuff online, it's getting bigger, and at some point you end up with a daisy chain of, of hard drives sitting around plugged into your, your <laughs> machine in your house. <laughs> So, so do you think Pogo Plug and, and services like that for the general consumer will will help enable or, or help drive the whole music in the cloud initiative then? So I, I think it, it helped drive people converting content to digital and, and right. keeping content and, and utilizing it. Uh, I mean, if, the, if it goes all the way up to a cloud provider, like if, if Apple made iTunes online with everything, um, then you wouldn't necessarily need to store um, your media on your own device, but this is the public-private thing, like you're saying, is yep. do we trust somebody else to keep our music collection for us, or do we want our own copy of it? I think that would be really, really big. Um, Scott, what do you think? Yeah, I don't know. Unfortunately, I'm not buying it, so I, I, I don't know if I'd really call them them cloud per se. It does seem to me. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that called a hard I'm drive? Not the to be the, the judge on that, but. Yeah. Uh, um, but at the end of the day, it does seem like more of a, re a remote kind of file access mechanism for, for people <laughs> to, to, to get access to, to, to music and, and videos and their, their data versus, versus something that's really a, you know, a cloud offering at the end of the day. Yeah, check it out. I have a desktop cloud right here. I'm like, All right, yeah. this, is, <laughs> this is my cloud right here. See, like we've got a keyboard. Nice. We've got a keyboard and a screen. <laughs> anyway. Um, Any... I guess, I guess you chimed in. So right. right. forget everyone. Okay, so um, next story. How much are cloud providers making, and is the best way to, to and the, is the best way to talk about it revenue per server or per customer? And I know there may not be some people here that can participate in this one, but I think it's an important <laughs> question to talk about nonetheless. So in you, general, for those of you who need to bow out, that's perfectly okay. Um, so just some some really so I guess first the first question is is what is the what is the measurement like how do you how do you actually quantify these? So um, there's really two ways to do it: revenue per server or revenue per customer. I will say I'll speak for the Rackspace. Um, guess Brett. Um, Rackspace very clearly believes that revenue per server uh, is the way to go. And that is that's basically the measurement. Um, but everyone else is, is basically leaning on per customer. Um, I guess. What, what, do you have a view on this? Or? Um. Well, what works? Is it working for you? you you're a Rackspace customer. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely working mm -hmm. for us. Um, and and I think it will in at least in the short term. It you know it'll scale nicely with with our growth as well. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I can only look at it in my own sort of isolated uh, state, but yeah, I think you know, revenue per. I'm happy with with what I'm paying for for my services, and they seem to be scaling at at a rate that is uh, effective and cost uh, cost effective for us. So yeah, I mean, that that's fine if they attach it to me. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't know uh, how much real usage I'm using on that server. Yeah, well, I think I mean, so from the article I I, I was reading, it says that um, for Rackspace. Um, it's been an upward trend in terms of revenue per server, and so they've made they've basically gone from 2,899 to 2,991 per server. Um, but the net revenue per cloud customer has declined, which would be a cost savings actually to right. the customer. So, well, so that's I actually I think a good thing for both both parties. In the on-demand model, it's like you know certain days we're using a lot more uh, bandwidth than others, and and so I can imagine that instead of them selling certain slices to startups, because mm -hmm. especially startups always think they're going to use more than they right. are, right? So they're, right. they're, they're yeah. renting these big slices and they're only using a portion of them. But you're locking out that, you know, you, you've dedicated that slice now to that user. In the cloud model, you can put a lot more people on that bus than, uh, than you would otherwise in a, in a sort of, um, you know, slice model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Scott, what do you think? Yeah, I think the, the revenue per customer, the overall discussion of, of metrics and who's making money in the cloud is a, is a pretty interesting one. You know, obviously, we're, we're focused a little bit more on the cloud application space, and, and I think the revenue per customer is a more natural metric. But you know, I think we're still seeing, um, given the fact that you know, the, the bigger scheme of things is still a relatively nascent space, that you do have vendors out there that are you know, quote unquote buying share and buying customers. And um, that's why I think it's t tough to look at the revenue per customer and the trend to, to draw any conclusions um, from that, given the fact you do have people out there discounting and, and aggressively trying to displace um, you know, legacy on-premise systems. So, um, 
you know, I think SaaS, what we're seeing now is that, um, you know, the, they're pricing to, to win deals. And, um, you know, what we're hearing from the major SaaS vendors that for the first time SaaS is, is winning the majority of new deals in the enterprise from an application standpoint. So I think it's it's a bit early to say, you know, who's quote unquote making money off of off the revenue per uh, customer or server metric right now. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So just a couple of numbers here from the same article because these are pretty interesting. Um, and somebody brought up in the in the chat room as well. Uh, Rackspace did 56 million in cloud revenue, so nothing having to do with their other business, just purely cloud. Cloud in 2009. Um, Amazon Web Services. It's really hard to tell. Um, yeah. The article also did call out that Rackspace has been unusually forthcoming about you know the, mm. about their revenues and their metrics, right. um, which is really awesome because we. Can so they're open in multiple ways, yeah. right, Brett? So, so yeah. that's, that's I mean, awesome. Yeah, we're we're very transparent because we yeah. we want to be uh, open business partners. Um, mm -hmm with the folks we work with and it, we want to let our customers know how we're doing because you want to know that you're working with a, a solid and stable partner when you're going to mm -hmm. trust your business, uh, your entire business in a lot of cases, people's whole company today is online and yeah. um, they, they want to make sure they're working with someone that they, they know has a solid footing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by the way, D-S-T-O-L-I-K-E-R wants credit for that. Uh, <laughs> so, good job. See, um, we pay attention to our chat room. Yes, we do. <laughs> so, um, so, so the other number I wanted to throw out there, and this is, we don't know if this is true or not, because it's very difficult. Um, Amazon on its balance sheet includes Amazon Web Services under other. Uh, <laughs> so, huh. And who knows other. what else, who else knows what's in, what else is in there, but basically that figure is 735 million. So we know it's not, so what we can tell from that is it's not higher than 735 million. Correct. Somewhere below that line. Probably a lot below that line, yeah. would be my guess. So. Wonder what else is in other. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like food much. labels, you know, when you see that thing, you know, by product of, right. you know, other, mm, you know, make sure. Yeah, yeah, so, but who knows. But anyway, but the other, the, what was really clear from the articles, there really are just, they're, they're really two big providers right now. Right. Are, are definitely Amazon and Rackspace. Um, the, the next one is uh, Savas Cloud, and they basically are reporting 7.4 million. Huh. in 2009, so definitely mm -hmm. a distant third compared to the other two. Yeah, I know we, we used Amazon as well. Um, earlier on, we you know we do these Twitter promotions where you can tweet to download a uh, song, and the first one we did was for Travis Barker and GGM, we released a mixtape, huh. and um, it was the first time we ever did it, and uh, we put this, the download on the same server as, as the application, and it crashed right away. So the first thing we did was put it on the Amazon Cloud, and it was a huge, you know, multi, you know, probably 70 megabyte file. And I think the bill I got after 25,000 people downloaded it was $200. So they're not, you know, they're not charging that much. So I can imagine that their, uh, their revenues are, are pretty low. Maybe, maybe that's because they're, they're, they're really trying to get user adoption and get as many people using the service before, before they start raising prices. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Um, I mean, w one other thing to think of too is you, you have that side of it where you maybe have something that's cheaper, but what about the services and support side? Yeah, we don't really talk a lot about that. It's no, we have more like just iron versus iron. Yeah. Or iron versus cloud. Exactly. And we've forgotten a lot of times about the humans that actually have to and operate the, the iron. Yeah. And Brett, I think you probably have something to say about that, don't you? Yeah, I mean, this is really why Rackspace is, is focused on uh, open standards and open technology because our um, core as a company is around what we call fanatical support and we uh, believe that you can have uh, technology parity and our goal at the end of the day is to really be a trusted partner and go above and beyond to take care of our customers and, and that's how um, we want to be viewed and that's the way we want to compete in the market. Right. We just got um, a note in the chat room that from the same person, TST. Yeah, I don't know how to say it. That's I don't, I don't know how to say your say name, it. but it's... S S Solikar. 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 <laughs> EC2 is super expensive, like $400 a month for support. Mm, for support. For support. Yeah, I, actually, I can attest to that. We actually, we, we use them in the past, and they, they do have, it does cost Travis money. Travis Stolikar. Did I say Travis that right, Stol Travis? There we go. Travis, <laughs> that's the person in the chat room, by the way. In the chat room. Who are watching this after the fact and don't know that what's going on in the chat room right now. <laughs> so... And wait, we have to pull Scott into yes, this too. Um, what about services and support? Is that, you know, real? Is is that a key factor here too, Scott? What do you think about the pricing with that? 
Yeah, you know, certainly it is for us, and we have, you know, we, we end up offering a variety of, of options for for customers uh, depending on what their their needs and, and business requirements are. But yeah, I think it's certainly important, and and you know, particularly for um, you know customers on the enterprise side that are are making the transition to the cloud and to, to cloud applications, and uh, a lot of it is is new to them, particularly on the IT side. I think support is a a, a critical um, you know part of the part of the equation here. Um, that I think is going to have an impact as well as, as to how far and how fast um, cloud and SaaS goes in the enterprise, what the adoption rate uh, looks like. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a key thing, a key, key ingredient in the mix here. Great. Well, I think we're about on the hour mark here. So what I would love to do is get any final parting thoughts from each of you. Scott, is there anything going on with conformity that you'd like people to know about before we close? No, just you know, very exciting times here. We're kind of high growth, uh, high growth mode here at uh, Conformity. Um, you know, I think the migration to cloud applications in the cloud is is you know happening faster than uh, um, than even we anticipated. And um, you know, we're we're having a great time working with our customers. I'm um, helping them get ahead of the curve from a manageability standpoint. Um, also, great to. Uh, to get our two inches of snow in Austin yesterday, which we didn't oh, talk I heard. about. But, yeah, wow. snow in Austin, who would have thought about That's that? Crazy. <laughs> there was actually a snowman in my yard yesterday, which I, I couldn't believe when I How got How long home. did you take to melt? <laughs> <laughs> Can they you do will. us a favor and plow all that before we get yeah, there before for Yeah, before we get Southwest. there for South by. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to bring a hat and scarf. <laughs> anyway, thank right. you so much, Scott. Scott Bills with Conformity. Um, yeah. Matt, we have Matt McNaughton over here. So any, any parting words with Culture Jam? Yeah, so um, Culture Jam, we just launched a, a new product called Promo Jam, and it's a, uh, it's a SaaS model content management system for building these Twitter promotions from the ground up, and it's, uh, it's a really powerful system and allows you to create a multiple, multitude of different Twitter promotions in a plug and play way and then track everything that's coming through there. Um, and yeah, we've you know we've been working with a lot of really great music artists like Pearl Jam and, and Rihanna, and we're just getting into other worlds, and we're working with the Pittsburgh Penguins and um, MGM Films. Thanks. We're doing Hot Tub Time Machine, Ooh. so uh, yeah, we're really excited for 2010, and, and um, we hope to take these social media applications into, into many different places. Along with with help from Rackspace, and as we grow, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll be uh, leaning heavily on the on the cloud servers. And with that, Brett Pyatt, what do you have for any final thoughts from Rackspace? So, uh, really, it's uh, if you're out there in the IT world and you haven't experimented with cloud or, or looked at it yet, um, spend some time. You can, 15 minutes, you can have servers up and running. You can have a, a platform account created for a dollar on your credit card. You can get up and wow. going. And, uh, Literally a dollar on your credit card. Yeah, a, a cent and a half an hour is our entry level wow. cloud server. So yeah, you could mess around all day for less than the price of a cup of coffee. Um, nice. and, and see how it can impact and change what you're doing today and how you can make your company better and more efficient. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And of course, cannot forget our show sponsor, Verticor. Thank you so much. Make sure you check them out, verticor.com and at Verticor on Twitter. So, and of course to my co-host, my lovely co-host oh, over here, Mark lovely. Jeffrey. Yes, you're the lovely one. <laughs> so thank you everyone here. for joining us here on the second episode of This Week in Cloud Computing. I am your host, Amanda Kulong, and see you next week, Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific time.